thinking about something that would be helpful. I, I don't want to just get up here and dazzle you with my brilliance and baffle you with my baloney. I want to give you something from the word, something that I need to hear, and if I need to hear it, you need to hear it. And most of the times I have discovered that I'm up here preaching to me. And it's amazing how that happens, that God could speak to me <laughs> through me. I'm just, I'm amazed. But I'm going to invite your attention over to Matthew chapter 14. And I believe that this is an important word for us. Matthew chapter 14. And you just hold your place there in Matthew 14. And while you're turning there, I want to remind you that the works of Jesus were teaching, preaching, and healing while he was here. Teaching, preaching, and healing. Teaching, preaching, and healing. So what he went round about the villages doing. And well, while you're heading over to Matthew 14, uh, Matthew 4, 23 says, Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of diseases among the people. And in Matthew 9, 35, Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Now, who was with Jesus while he did this? His disciples. So the disciples were with Jesus. Can you agree with that? Is it safe to say that everywhere Jesus went doing these works, teaching, preaching, and healing, his disciples were there, being a part of it, witnessing it, seeing it, <clears throat> experiencing it, <clears throat> And they were with him through everything, okay? Matthew chapter 14. So we're going to look at this, this, um, <clears throat> this little miracle here <clears throat> with five loaves and two fishes. And uh, verse, well, so look, let's see, verse 14. So 14, 14. Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick, who was right there with him, his disciples. And in verse 15, when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a desert place and the time is now part. Send the multitude away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. Well, we don't say that today, but, you know, they, want, they need to go get some hamburgers and French fries and hot Chicago dogs and all that. In verse 16, Jesus said unto them, they need not depart. Give ye them to eat. And in verse 17, they say unto him, uh, we've only got five loaves and two fishes. And he said, well, bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass, and he took the five loaves and the two fishes. Looking up to heaven, he blessed and he brake, and he gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat and were filled, and they took up of the fragments in, that remained 12 baskets full and... They that had eaten were about 5,000 men beside women and children. Um, that's pretty significant. That's a whole lot of folks. We're, they only numbered the 5,000 men. Then there were the, the women and the children, right? So you have who knows how many. Quite a, quite a big crowd. And I can just imagine the disciples thinking, what's five loaves and two fishes going to do? That's my lunch. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And so this is amazing, and, and I love this because it sets the stage for, it sets the stage for us pertaining to something here. Is it fair for me to say to you that Jesus was a master teacher? Could, he, could we say that? Absolutely. So he goes round about the villages teaching, preaching, and healing. Was he also a master communicator and preacher of the gospel? Well, yeah. And my goodness gracious, healing all manner of sickness, all manner of diseases among the people. And he's just whipping up food miracles. And all he did was just bless them. So all he did was just look up to heaven, right? He didn't do a little happy dance, a jig. He didn't call down fire from heaven. You know, he didn't do incantations and wave magic wands and so forth. And this miracle took place and his disciples were right there with them. So is it safe to say then that in addition to him being a master teacher, a master communicator and preacher, that the atmosphere of heaven was in full display 
So when you got around this stuff, you were basking in the ambiance of heaven. All right. Well, praise the Lord. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> Verse 22. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray, and when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. Now who's in the ship? The disciples. And these are the ones who had been a part of the miraculous. They'd witnessed things. They'd seen things that under normal conditions would never happen. You can't feed you can't feed 5,000 plus with five loaves and two fishes, yet that's exactly what happened. And I'm wondering if, I'm wondering what their thinking is, because while we were singing over here to the Lord, I, I had this, I'm thinking of, and I, you call me crazy, I'm seeing these disciples in this boat. I'm seeing the disciples in this boat. The ship was now, Verse 24, the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, in the fourth watch of the night, so between 3 and 6 a.m., in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. Now, that's not normal, is it? Now, up to this point, and correct me if I'm wrong, some of you are... Um, qualified theologians in the building. This is the only person so far in the Bible that I know of that is recorded that actually walked on the water. I mean, Moses parted the Red Sea, so he didn't walk on the water with the Israelis, did he? No, no, the sea parted and they walked on dry land. And I'm thinking there's some stuff that happened in the Old Testament, but I don't remember an example of anybody actually walking on the water Unless you watch that movie uh, um, with uh, the black actor Morgan Freeman and then uh, Bruce Almighty. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they walked on the water. Okay, so maybe there's three that walked on the water. So Jesus is walking on the water, and verse 26, when the disciples saw him walking on the sea... They were troubled, saying, it is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. Well, that's a normal reaction. If you're sitting in the boat and you got things happening, and here comes somebody walking on the water, the first thing, the first thing I'm thinking is, oh, snap, this ain't normal. And, and that's exactly what they thought. But straightway, in verse 27, Jesus spake unto them, saying, be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. Hmm. Now... Peter, in verse 28, answered and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. How many of you would say that? Don't raise your hand and be a liar. <laughs> I don't think I would have. Well, Lord, if that's really you, tell me to come walking on the water with you. I'm sitting in the boat, I'm thinking... It's rough enough out there. I'm going to stay right here where it's safe. I mean, it ain't really ain't too safe anyway because we're having some trouble. But I love the fact that Peter just said, well, if it's really you, bid me come unto thee on the water. So in other words, Peter is saying, if it's you, then I'm going to do the same thing too. Read it. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. On the water, not in it, <laughs> on it. Man, that's, that's pretty salty right there. That's pretty crazy. But this is Peter we're talking about. Well, this is the Bible too, Pastor. This doesn't apply to us. I think that's the trouble with the church today is that nothing really applies to us anymore. After all, these are modern times. You know, this is, this is the church of the new age. No, this is the church of the last minute. Right. 
That's what we are. We're the church of the last minute of time. And maybe there's a lesson here for us. I know there is a, me a message here for me because now get this. So we're talking about a group in a boat that travels with Jesus, been with Jesus, witnessed all kinds of things, and they had literally just experienced the miracle with the five loaves and two fishes. And now they're in a boat, and you have some weather situation coming on, and, and Jesus is walking out there, and Peter says, well, if it's you, I could do the same thing. And verse 29, he said, one simple word, come. Come And when Peter was come down out of the ship, what did he do? He walked on the water to go to Jesus. So just sit in the boat with me for a minute and think about this. You're like, that ain't normal. I mean, first of all, I'm freaked out over this guy walking on the water. Second of all, this nut Peter, he's always been impulsive. Peter's always somewhat maybe even been considered an embarrassment in church because he's just a little bit too boisterous for me. Hmm. And, you know, he's the guy that gets into a, into a crowd with you and he, he don't care. He just, he's unfiltered. I mean, heck, in the garden, of, when it came to arrest Jesus, he took, he took out his sword and whacked off a dude's ear. It's like, whoa. And so Peter is doing what? What only... Jesus up to this point has done, and that's walking on the water in the natural and impossibility. It's an absolute impossibility no matter what anybody says. This is not normal stuff. So it has to be coming from a different realm rather than the natural realm, because in the natural realm, you don't feed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fishes. Heck, it probably was 10,000 people plus, right? OK. And you don't walk on the water. And then Peter just needed a simple word from God so that he could do exactly what his Lord and Savior was doing. I wonder. I wonder if later in John 14, I, I, I wonder. If the things that I do, you'll do. I wonder if that applies to us today. I wonder if there's something there for us where, you know, we're limited because, because why? Because we limit ourselves, not because God limits us. God doesn't put any limits on us. If it's really you, bid me come so I can do exactly what you're doing. And Jesus simply said, come. But Jesus also said unto us in Mark 16, what? These signs will follow, yeah. not might follow. They will follow the believing ones. The trouble is that we don't know what we really believe. It's an impossibility, but he said, come. Nobody's ever done it before, but he said, come. This doesn't make any sense, but he said, come. I don't have the feelings, but he said, come. Huh. Feelings? Should we talk about feelings? You want to go there? There are times when, in spite of the feelings, you have to get up, dress up, show up, and then don't give up. If, if I went by feelings this morning, I'd be in bed right now because I am wiped out, exhausted, and cranky. And need another cup of coffee. I should have taken my wife up on her offer when I left the, the house. She says, you sure you don't want some? So I already had some, girl. I'm coffeeed up. Well, I didn't have enough. So the disciples are sitting in the boat, all except one. How come? Because they didn't get out of the boat with him. Jesus said, come. He does not say, only Peter, only Peter, nobody else, the rest of yous stay seated. Just Peter, just Peter, just Peter. He said, come, and that word has enough power and authority for everyone 
whosoever will step out of the boat. <clears throat> I mean, I don't know what the church is waiting for today because there, there's much to be done in these closing moments of time. And there are people literally just waiting for what we have. And yet we're more interested in coming up with gimmicks and gadgets and programs rather than just give them the spirit of almighty God and give them the word. You don't have to decipher whether or not it's relevant. You don't have to worry about whether or not it's practical. Just give people the word and let them step out of the boat. And so now, some of the disciples, I'm sure, were sitting there going, Leave it to Peter. And, and I'm thinking there may have been a disciple who might have even been thinking, mm, yeah, with his impulsive self, this ain't going to last long. Watch. Any number of things could have been happening in that boat at that moment, but only one of them stepped out and walked on the water, and Peter is the second person in all of the Bible that I know of who actually walked on top of water, and it wasn't frozen. <laughs> I've never done this. I don't know that I have the nerve to step out of a boat. <laughs> I mean, seriously, un unless I want to go swimming. And I prefer to just stay inside the boat. And so the next verse tells us, but, now in my Bible, so what I did in verse 29, I highlight, I highlighted, he walked on the water. And then when I get to verse 30, I highlight it, but. He walked on the water, but. He walked on the water. Why can't we just say he walked on the water, period? Exclamation, because there's a but. That three-letter pesky word, but. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He was doing just fine until he did what? Until he saw. And he got afraid and he began to sink and he cried saying, Lord, save me. I mean, aren't you glad that Jesus just didn't stand there and watch him go under and waved at him as he went? Because the Bible says immediately in verse 31, Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, I am so sorry to put you through this, Peter. What was I thinking? A mere mortal such as yourself can't walk on water. Huh. No, he said, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Boy, if that doesn't make a guy feel worse, this is my fault. So in other words, this is my fault now, Lord. You're the one that told me to come. You're the one that asked. <clears throat> Have you ever asked God for something? Have you ever asked God to use you to a greater capacity or a greater degree? And, and I'm telling you something. I'm guilty. I'm the one that's saying, Lord, I can't have mediocrity anymore in my life. But see, here's the problem. As soon as my heart began to cry out for more, I have been slammed with more opposition and nonsense that I, I, I can't even recall when it's been so crazy in my life. And I'm like, am I going get, to get a break here anytime soon, Lord? Or is this just going to be one wave of opposition after another? Buffeting, buffeting, buffeting. Why? To slow my roll, that's why. This is what the enemy's trying to do in your life, is to back you up and slow you down. <laughs> you want to do more for God? <laughs> Watch this. Watch and see what happens to your finances. Oh, who said that? I did. See, this is the way it works for all of us. When you begin to cry out for more, when you begin to press in and contend for more, do you think the devil's just going to step out of the way and say, oh, there you go, right, th right, you want more? It's through that door. I'll step out of the way so you won't have to worry about me because you want to do more for God. 
Nobody else in the boat asked the Lord for this. Peter was the only one, if it's you, bid me come. I didn't see anybody else raising their hand saying, oh, me too, Lord, me too. Because it's insane nuttiness to think that you could step out of a boat and walk on water. Thank God. <clears throat> Thank God we have this passage of Scripture to teach us some important lessons on faith. And the first and the most significant one that stood out to me is that Peter succeeded in walking on the water and he failed in walking on the water all in the same moment. I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like I'm on top of the world and in the next breath, the world's on top of me. And I'm like, how did I fall to this level like that? How did that happen? And you want to know what the answer is? I'll tell you what the answer is. You want to know what it is? You're going to get this deep theological answer that's taken me 30 years to find out, and it's this. It's called life. Life happens. And I can't predict things, and I can't tell you why, when, where, who, how, and all that stuff. I can just tell you that you might be on top of the world right now, and in three seconds or three breaths later, you're ready to throw in the towel. Now, I know I'm not talking to anybody up here but me, because this doesn't apply to anybody. It's just the way things are. And the lesson here for me and the lesson here for you is that when life doesn't make any sense and you go from being up here to down here, you cannot quit. You must not abandon your faith. You have got to stay the course and say, listen, one thing you're not going to do, devil, is kill me. Because if you could have, you would have. And so I'm not going to lay it down and give up. I might want to. I might even plan to do it. I've heard some amazing testimonies of people who were about ready to pull the trigger or drive their car into a tree, and somehow something happened to keep them here to live and fight another day. Phew. Wow. That's our God. That's our God working on our behalf. So Peter succeeded in walking on water, and he failed in walking on water. So no matter what it is that's happening in your world and in your life, you must not give up. You must not abandon your faith. But notice the difference, the difference maker in, in what he experienced here in, in this particular passage of Scripture is verse 30. But when he saw the wind boisterous, sometimes you have to say, I will not consider the circumstances or my feelings, or the bank report, or the news report, or the letter from the attorney, I won't consider that. Because if I start looking at that too much, what's going to happen? You're going to begin to sink. And you're going to let go, and you're going to have to cry out and say, Lord, save me. You know, that's probably one of the best prayers you could pray. Lord, save me. And we try to get clever and cute, and we say to people, now, now bow your heads and, and pray with me this prayer and say these exact words, dear God in heaven, dear God in heaven, I come to you now, I come to you now. Like, why do we do that to people? Lord, save me! Help! Help! The simpler, the better, that's what I'm thinking. <clears throat> when fear takes hold, fear comes in. He was afraid. I'll tell you, somebody put it this way one time. They said, guys, when fear comes in the front door, faith goes out the back door. You can't do both. You can't be in both. You cannot be, I'm in faith, and then in fear at the same time. It's one or the other. But you can't do both. And fear is a monster. And we don't want to get too technical here because I think the message this morning has to be very practical for you is that you're going to feel on top of the world sometimes. And moments later, the world's going to seem like it's on you, but you cannot quit. This is, this is where children of God have, have just got to 
stand their ground and say, I, this doesn't make any sense. It doesn't feel good. I don't even like myself right now, but I'm not quitting. I'm going to hang in there. I'm going to hang in there because, because God is not going to abandon me and forsake me. Now, there is a difference here between, I said, uh, and I put it this way, there is a difference between faith and flesh. Now, when I say flesh, I don't mean the body that you live in. I don't mean the flesh right here, because you don't see the real Gary. I, in fact, I've never seen the real me. I've looked in the mirror and I've tried, but he's, he's, he's elusive. He's down in here somewhere. And so when I say flesh, I mean the carnal mind. I mean the realm of, of carnality, if you will. Uh, so when I say flesh, I mean carnality, worldliness, maybe we could say it that way. So it's hard to know the difference between faith and flesh because both are characterized by action. So faith steps out of the boat with the word come as your foundation. Jesus said, come, I'm stepping out. Flesh just steps out because it's got feelings and impulses. Huh, well, if Peter could do it, huh, huh, I'm not going to be outdone by him. Watch this. Wow, that didn't go very well. I'm sure there's maybe some competition. You know that there is. Because if you read the narrative of the Gospels, you find out that the disciples were people just like you and me. So there's going to be some competition. There's going to be some jealousy. There's going to be some carnality. <clears throat> and you know what? It's a good thing the other guys sat in the boat and didn't try to get out. Now, I know it sounds like I'm contradicting my first point. No, I'm not contradicting anything. The point I'm making is simply this. We need a foundation of faith before we launch out on anything. And just because I tell you to do something doesn't mean you should do it. Huh? Boy, there's a twister, huh? Wait a minute. You're the pastor. Yeah, but guess what? Sometimes I don't know everything. Wow. That's a shocker, huh? Flesh will step out on feelings and impulses, and it's often difficult to know the difference. And that's why you need to be around believers who are grounded and settled, who can help balance you out. That's why you need to stay in the word. And just because somebody opens, just because somebody opens their Bible and says, now please turn to, does not mean that you are going to get the gospel message preached to you. Because often what we do is we give folks a version of the gospel. We don't give them the gospel. You know, I've often wondered, and, and I keep pondering, and I have to keep thinking about these things, and I, all the issues and heartaches and things that I go through, all they do is, is they keep me from meditating on these precious moments that God has given me, such as the time I was at the cross. You went to the cross. When did you go to the cross? I was in a church service in Indianapolis and never had anything like it happened uh, up until that point, and nothing like it has really happened since. But I can remember being in Indianapolis before I ever knew about Byron, Illinois, and I was candidating for a church out there. I didn't know about you guys because I, ne I never would have went there to even try out for another church. Um, <clears throat> but as I was introducing myself and and my wife, Valerie, at the time, we had just the two, the two girls, Kate and Kara, right? It was the two of them. Um, and I was talking about my two young daughters. That was the last thing I remember. I was in the pulpit, and I said, my wife, I'm married to Valerie. She was, she was in uh, Oklahoma, and we've got Caitlin and Kara. And the next thing I know it, I was at the cross. And I'm like, I couldn't speak. I couldn't function. I just broke, my flesh melted, and I just began to weep and wail. And I've always wondered about that. It's like, that was an unusual moment for me because nothing like that had happened up to that point or since. But the magnitude and the enormity of the cross, I felt it. I felt it. And now when I say that to you, you might think, oh, isn't that cute? You must have had too much pepperoni the night before or maybe the chili was working overtime on your system. 
you know. Um, no, it, was ha it happened to me in the middle of speaking, introducing myself, and the next thing I know it, for the next hour, I wept and I wailed uncontrollably. And it was the strangest feeling that I felt everything that that cross represented. And the church today has a sanitized version of the cross. And if you don't believe me, look behind me. What's on the wall? That is a sanitized version of the cross of Christ. We wear sanitized versions around our neck. We have sanitized versions on our body of crosses. I don't. <laughs> and we don't understand this gospel, what took place on that cross. We don't understand things like, I was crucified with Christ. We say, oh, ain't that just a lovely figure of speech? No, you were actually brought to the cross with him, the old Jew, the old person that was connected to sin and death, the old person that was broken beyond repair and restoration, the old person that you were had to be put on the cross, not only were you crucified, but you were buried with him and raised up together with him and made to sit with him in heavenly places. I'm talking about that gospel, that that work, what that did for you and for me is put us in such a position spiritually, that the enemy does everything that he knows how to do to keep you from waking up to the fact that you ain't in trouble with God no more. You're not an old sinner anymore. You were an old, worthless sinner until you were saved by grace. And then you were made brand new, a brand new act of creation that took place. You are so full of the life and nature and ability of God that it will literally scare you, the potential that exists within you. He does exceeding abundantly above all that you could ask or think according to the power that works in you. And if we ever get a hold of this, we might be able to change things for good instead of watching them slip away. Faith steps out. And so does the flesh, and it's hard to know the difference. But the other lesson that I get from this passage of Scripture is that if I take one step in faith, and that step out of the boat, and that step on top of the water, so Peter had to put one foot down, and then he went and got the other one, and he went, <laughs> Until he did what? Oh, oh, what am I doing? I can't do this. <clears throat> if you walk one step by faith, you must walk the next 100 steps by faith. It will be no other way in life. The just shall live by faith. We walk by faith. I mean, there are so many passages of Scripture to encourage you in this life of faith that you can do this by faith, regardless of what the doctor said, the lawyer said, the politician said, the news reporter said, regardless of what they're telling you is going to happen in November. Oh, things will change in November. You know that. They will. But nothing's ever staying the same. <laughs> We're always changing. Heck, I'm changing every day. More gray hair in places that I didn't, you know, I look and I say, more, what the heck is going on? That's what my grandfather used to look like. <laughs> if we do not walk this walk by faith, we have just limited ourselves. And those other disciples limited themselves. They talked themselves out of it. And it's probably a good thing because some of them would have gotten out of that boat under the wrong pretense. And if you are to do this, this life of faith, you have to commit yourself to following it out regardless of how you feel, regardless of what does or doesn't happen. You have to continue to stay the course and say, I am a 
faith child of a faith God living a faith life. And I go to a faith church and I worship with faith brothers and sisters. Guys, this is all about faith. Hebrews, you can make a note of Hebrews eleven six. Without faith, it is difficult to please God. No, it's impossible to please him. In other words, you cannot please God apart from faith. And if God is telling me that my faith pleases him, then I owe it to my God to grow and develop in that faith. And I can't grow and develop in that faith by watching CNN all day or Fox News all day, whichever one you choose. And I can't grow and develop in my faith if I'm sitting in a church that tells me I'm a worthless worm and I need to be beat down week after week. No, you need to be lifted up week after week. Somebody needs to show you the full potential of what you were made to do. I mean, take the limits off. If it's you, bid me come. If Jesus said, come. Like, no big deal. I mean, he might have even said it with attitude. Come. Big deal. You can walk on water too. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. If we walk by faith, we've got to do it. We can't walk by faith in sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. And in Mark 9, 23, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. Not him that processes things logically, because logically, most things don't make sense that we talk about. How could one man die for the whole world? Well, (laughs) see, that's the problem. We don't get it. And then we cheat ourselves out of the miraculous and like the preacher, I mean, I heard him say it. Well, no, it was, the virgin birth was just really a a metaphor. For what? Well, virgins can't get pregnant. It is an impossibility for virgins to give birth. And I I was like, ew, I would never listen to you preach. So now you're going to excuse the virgin birth and say, that never happened. Well, then you're still lost in your sins and going to hell. And this didn't happen. And that didn't happen. And heck, we don't even know if we can really believe this. This is all I've got. When everything else around me fails and it will, this is all I have to stand on. And there have been times in my life when I have literally placed the Bible in the middle of the room and stood on it and said, I am backing up off of this devil, no matter how hard you hit me. I may get, here's the beautiful thing. And I don't know much about anything in life. I'm just an average guy and I'm not even a good guy. And I say that all the time because I believe that in and of myself, I have nothing to offer you, nothing. But the beautiful thing is I've had a little bit of experience with putting boxing gloves on and getting in a ring with somebody else, and you never lose a fight because you get knocked down. Unless you stay down. And if you stay down for the count of 10, you're out. But if you get back up, now you can't keep letting yourself get knocked down, (laughs) but you get back up, catch your breath, And do you know that you might get knocked down once and you might get knocked down twice and it may look like you ain't going to win, but you can land one just the right way and all of a sudden that guy across from you goes, boom! Stay down, stay down, stay down, stay down. (laughs) So there is no shame or failure or fault in getting knocked down and you may have fallen with a great big bang, But as long as you get back up and you just keep coming, man, it's hard to do something with a guy that won't stop coming at you. Praise the Lord. This faith business, this is pretty serious stuff. This is what we were made to do. We were made to be like him. Now, just in case you're wondering, I don't know if I really believe all that. I'm glad you said that. We'll conclude right here in John this faith life is a, is a serious matter. 
And if you are not growing and developing in your faith, then you are shrinking back in it. Wow! You of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Never once, when Jesus was chastising, chiding, or rebuking the disciples, never once did he ever say, I'm so sorry, I should have known that this was going to be hard for you to get with. Oh, bad Messiah. I should never have done this. No, because he was always teaching them and showing them and helping them come up another level because he was going to be leaving and they were the ones that were going to have to carry on the ministry. And in John 14... You good for just another moment? You know, I got to read verse 6. I love verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am one of the many ways. I know how you can find truth. No, Jesus said, I am the way. I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Who's going to be able to get around this verse? Nobody. You all have to come to him the same way. Verse 7, if you had known me, you should have known my name also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth or satisfies us. Show us the Father. Hmm. That's That's a good thing to ask, right? In verse 9, Jesus saith unto him, are you nuts? Nobody could see the Father. No, Jesus said, have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Verse 10, believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me. He does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else, or else, believe me for the very work's sake. So the things that Jesus did help to show the Father and to reveal the Father, right? But now, why in the world? I was fine up until verse 12. I had no problem. From a theological, (laughs) ecclesiastical, homiletical, hermeneutical, homogenized, standpoint, I get to verse 12 and he completely messes me up. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do because I go unto my father. I went, huh? I know he ain't talking about me. He got to be talking to them. He's got to be talking about people in Bible days. He's talking about Bible people that were written about. He's talking about Bible people that I'll never meet until I get to heaven. He's not talking about me. He's talking about a special group of people whom he selected. No, he said, he that believeth on me. Who does that include? Well, I claim to be a believer. Well, then that includes you, Gary. See, he that believeth on me, the work that I do, what works? Well, I told you at the beginning. He went round about the villages teaching, preaching, and healing. Teaching, preaching, and healing. Oh, and he turned some fish and bread into enough food to feed thousands of people. What didn't Jesus do while he was here? And he's got the audacity to tell you and me if we're going to claim to believe on him. Lord, if it's you, bid me come. Do you really mean that, Peter? Because all I got is one word, and you're going to be able to walk on water for the rest of your life. Whatever, whatever I do, you're going to do also. And then he messes it up even more. He says, and greater works than these shall he do. Because I go unto my father. Well, what happened when he went to his father? He sent the Holy Spirit who empowers you and equips you and enables you to go and do the exact same things in his name. And we talk ourselves out of it because we disqualify ourselves because I'm just an old worthless worm. I don't deserve anything from you, Lord. If we are 
if we are going to be, and we are the cleanup crew, the wrap-up crew, and we've got to take a step up higher because what's coming? The Bible does promise some things, wonderful, great, precious promises, but the Bible also tells us that perilous times, times that are so hard to deal with, difficulties, a departure from what you once knew. Listen, the departure has already happened. The things that we are experiencing now, they're just normal, and people, it, they've been normalized, and the church is just okay with it. Well, Jesus gets us. I, I know he does. <laughs> he does. But he's not calling you to align yourself with unholiness. He's not calling you to turn a deaf, you know, just to not say anything. Listen, let your voice be heard on November 4th. I promise you, it is going to make a difference if all of us show up and do our job and vote. I encourage you to make a difference and go out there and vote. Well, what are we making a difference for, though, Pastor? Everything's going fine as far as I'm concerned. Huh? Yeah, you know, the bottom line is this, and I hate to say it. As long as some of us could keep doing this, and getting our TikToks on, and posting. As long as some of us can, it doesn't affect our social media, we're good. Just don't mess with my social media. See, there are other things that Jesus was referring to when he talked about the works. Jesus was about setting captives free, not enslaving them, not putting them into bondage, but setting people free. Well, this could easily be a second third, fourth, fifth, and sixth parter. Suffice it to say that you are called to a life of faith, but not to take one step in faith and then to fall back into the flesh. Stay the course with me. Let's keep going. Let's keep moving forward, no matter what comes next. Well, here's the point. The point simply is this. No matter what challenges or difficulties or hardships come, if we're committed to doing God's work, there's no plan B, there's just other ways to fulfill plan A. Right. That's it. That's what I'm talking about. 